The assistant commissioner walked along a short and narrow street, like a wet, muddy trench, then crossing a very broad thoroughfare, entered a public edifice, and sought speech with a young private secretary, unpaid, of a great personage. This fair, smooth-faced young man, whose symmetrically arranged hair gave him the air of a large and neat schoolboy, met the assistant commissioner's request with a doubtful look, and spoke with bated breath. Would he see you? I don't know about that. He walked over from the house an hour ago to talk with the permanent undersecretary, and now he's ready to walk back again. He might have sent for him, but he does it for the sake of a little exercise, I suppose. It's all the exercise he can find time for while this session lasts. I don't complain. I rather enjoy these little strolls. He leans on my arm and doesn't open his lips. But I say, he's very tired and, well, not in the sweetest of tempers, you know? It's in connection with that Greenwich affair. Oh, I say, he's very bitter against you people, but I will go and see if you insist. Do, that's a good fellow, said the assistant commissioner. The unpaid secretary admired this pluck. Composing for himself an innocent face, he opened a door and went in with the assurance of a nice and privileged child, and presently he reappeared with a nod to the assistant commissioner, who, passing through the same door, left open for himself, found himself with a great personage in a large room. Vast in bulk and stature, with a long white face, which broadened at the base by a big double chin, appeared egg-shaped in the fringe of thin, grayish whiskers. The great personage seemed an expanding man. Unfortunate from a tailoring point of view, the cross folds in the middle of a buttoned black coat added to the impression, as if the fastenings of the garment were tried to the utmost. From the head, set upward on a thick neck, the eyes with puffy lower lids stared with a haughty droop on each side of a hooked aggressive nose, nobly salient, and the vast, pale circumstances of the face. A shiny silk hat and a pair of worn gloves lying ready on the edge of a long table looked expanded too, enormous. He stood on the hearth rug in big, roomy boots and uttered no word of greeting. I would like to know if this is the beginning of another dynamite campaign, he asked, at once in a deep, very smooth voice. Don't go into details, I have no time for that. The assistant commissioner's figure before this big and rustic presence had the frail slenderness of a reed addressing an oak, and indeed the unbroken record of that man's descent surpassed in the number of centuries the age of the oldest oak in the country. No, as far as one can be positive about anything, I can assure you that it is not. Yes, but your idea of assurances over there, said the great man, with a contemptuous wave of his hand towards a window, giving on the broad thoroughfare, seems to consist mainly in making the Secretary of State look like a fool. I have been told positively in this very room less than a month ago that nothing of the sort was even possible. The Assistant Commissioner glanced in the direction of the window calmly. You will allow me to remark, Sir Ethelred, that so far I have no opportunity to give you assurances of any kind. The haughty droop of the eyes was focused now upon the assistant commissioner. True, confessed the deep, smooth voice. I sent for heat. You are still rather a novice in your berth. And how are you getting on over there? I believe I am learning something every day. Of course, of course, I hope you will get on. Thank you, Sir Ethelred. I have learned something today, even within the last hour or so. 
There is much in this affair of a kind that does not meet the eye in a usual anarchist outrage, even if one looked into it as deep as can be. That's why I am here. The great man put his arms akimbo, the backs of his big hands resting on his hips. Very well, go on. Only no details, Bray. Spare me the details. You shall not be troubled with them, Sir Ethelred, the assistant commissioner began, with a calm and untroubled assurance. While he was speaking, the hands on the face of the clock, behind the great man's back, a heavy, glistening affair of massive scrolls, and the same dark marble as the mantelpiece, and with a ghostly, evanescent tick, had moved through the space of seven minutes. He spoke with a studious fidelity to a parenthetical manner into which every little fact, that is, every detail, fitted with delightful ease. Not a murmur, nor even a movement, hinted at interruption. The great personage might have been the statue of one of his own princely ancestors, stripped of a crusader's war harness, and put into an ill-fitting frock coat. The assistant commissioner felt as though he were at liberty to talk for an hour, but he kept his head, and at the end of the time mentioned above he broke off with a sudden conclusion, which, reproducing the opening statement, pleasantly surprised Sir Ethelred by its apparent swiftness and force. The kind of thing which meets us under the surface of this affair, otherwise without gravity, is unusual, in this precise form at least, and requires special treatment. The tone of Sir Ethelred was deepened, full of conviction. I should think so, involving the ambassador of a foreign power. Oh, the ambassador, protested the other, erect and slender, allowing himself a mere half-smile. It would be stupid of me to advance anything of the kind, and it is absolutely unnecessary, because if I am right in my surmises, whether ambassador or hall-porter, it's a mere detail. Sir Ethelred opened a wide mouth, like a cavern, into which the hooked nose seemed anxious to peer. There came from it a subdued rolling sound, as if from a distant organ, with the scornful indignation stop. No, these people are too impossible. What do they mean by importing their methods of crim tartare here? A Turk would have more decency. You forget, Sir Ethelred, that strictly speaking, we know nothing positively as yet. No. But how would you define it, shortly? Barefaced audacity amounting to childishness of a peculiar sort. We can't put up with the innocence of nasty little children, said the great and expanded personage, expanding a little more, as it were. The haughty drooping glance struck crushingly the carpet at the assistant commissioner's feet. They'll have to get a hard rap on the knuckles over this affair. We must be in a position, too. What is your general idea, stated, shortly? No need to go into details. No, Sir Ethelred. In principle, I should lay it down that the existence of secret agents should not be tolerated, as tending to augment the positive dangers of the evil against which they are used. That the spy will fabricate his information is a mere commonplace. But in the sphere of political and revolutionary action, relying partly on violence, the professional spy has every facility to fabricate the very facts themselves, and will spread the double evil of emulation in one direction, and of panic, hasty legislation, unreflecting hate on the other. However, this is an imperfect world. The deep-voiced presence on the hearthrug, motionless with big elbows stuck out, said hastily, Be lucid, please. Yes, Sir Ethelred, an imperfect world. 
Therefore, directly, the character of this affair suggested itself to me. I thought it should be dealt with, with special secrecy, and ventured to come over here. That's right, approved the great personage, glancing down complacently over his double chin. I'm glad there's somebody over at your shop who thinks that the Secretary of State may be trusted now and then. The assistant commissioner had an amused smile. I was really thinking that it might be better at this stage for heat to be replaced by... What? Heat? An ass, eh? exclaimed the great man with distinct animosity. Not at all, pray, Sir Ethelred. Don't put that unjust interpretation on my remarks. Then what? Too clever by half? Neither, at least not as a rule. All the grounds of my surmises have from him. The only thing I've discovered by myself is that he has been making use of that man privately. Who could blame him? He's an old police hand. He told me virtually that he must have tools to work with. It occurred to me that this tool should be surrendered to the Special Crimes Division as a whole, instead of remaining the private property of Chief Inspector Heat. I extend my conception of our departmental duties to the suppression of the secret agent. But Chief Inspector Heat is an old departmental hand. He would accuse me of perverting its morality and attacking its efficiency. He would define it bitterly as protection extended to the criminal class of revolutionists. It would mean just that to him. Yes, but what do you mean? I mean to say, first, that there is but poor comfort in being able to declare that any given act of violence damaging property or destroying life is not the work of anarchism at all, but of something else altogether, some species of authorized scoundrelism. This, I fancy, is much more frequent than we suppose. Next, it's obvious that the existence of those people in the pay of foreign governments destroys in a measure the efficiency of our supervision. A spy of that sort can afford to be more reckless than the most reckless of conspirators. His occupation is free from all restraint. He's without as much faith as is necessary for complete negation, and without that much law as is implied in lawlessness. Thirdly, the existence of these spies amongst the revolutionary groups, which we are reproached for harboring here, does away with all certitude. You have received a reassuring statement from my Chief Inspector Heat some time ago. It was by no means groundless, and yet this episode happens. I call it an episode because this affair, I make bold to say, is episodic. It is no part of any general scheme, however wild. The very peculiarities which surprise and perplex Chief Inspector Heat, establish its character in my eyes. I am keeping clear of details, Sir Ethelred. The personage on the hearth had been listening with profound attention. Just so. Be as concise as you can. The assistant commissioner intimated by an earnest, deferential gesture that he was anxious to be concise. There is a peculiar stupidity and feebleness in the conduct of this affair, which gives me excellent hopes of getting behind it and finding there something else than an individual freak of fanaticism. For it is a planned thing, undoubtedly. The actual perpetrator seems to have been led by the hand to the spot, and then abandoned hurriedly to his own devices. The Inference is that he was imported from abroad for the purpose of committing this outrage. At the same time, one is forced to the conclusion that he did not know enough English to ask his way, unless one were to accept the fantastic theory that he was a deaf mute. I wonder now, but this is idle. He has destroyed himself by an accident, obviously. Not an extraordinary accident but an extraordinary little fact remains. 
the address on his clothing discovered by the merest accident too. It is an incredible little fact, so incredible that the explanation which will account for it is bound to touch the bottom of this affair. Instead of instructing Heat to go on with this case, my intention is to seek this explanation personally, by myself, I mean, where it may be picked up. That's in a certain shop in Brett Street, and on the lips of a certain secret agent, once upon a time the confidential and trusted spy of the late Baron Stott Fartenheim, ambassador of a great power to the court of St. James. The assistant commissioner paused, then added, Those fellows are a perfect pest. In order to raise his drooping glance to the speaker's face, the personage on the hearth rug had gradually tilted his head farther back, which gave him an aspect of extraordinary haughtiness. Why not leave it to heat? Because he is an old departmental hand. They have their own morality. My line of inquiry would appear to him an awful perversion of duty. For him, the plain duty is to fasten the guilt upon as many prominent anarchists as he can on some slight indications he had picked up in the course of his investigation on the spot, whereas I, he would say, am bent upon vindicating their innocence. I am trying to be as lucid as I can in presenting this obscure matter to you without details. He would, would he, muttered the proud head of Sir Ethelred from its lofty elevation. I am afraid so, with an indignation and disgust of which you or I can have no idea. He's an excellent servant. We must not put an undue strain on his loyalty. That's always a mistake. Besides, I want a free hand, a freer hand than it would be perhaps advisable to give Chief Inspector Heat. I haven't the slightest wish to spare this man Verloc. He will, I imagine, be extremely startled to find his connection with this affair, whatever it may be, brought home to him so quickly. Frightening him will not be very difficult, but our true objective lies behind him somewhere. I want your authority to give him such assurance of personal safety as I may think proper. Certainly, said the personage on the hearth, find out as much as you can. Find it out in your own way. I must set about it without loss of time. This very evening, said the assistant commissioner. Sir Ethelred shifted one hand under his coat-tails, and tilting back his head, looked at him steadily. We'll have a late sitting tonight, he said. Come to the house with your discoveries if we are not gone home. I'll warn Toodles to look out for you. He'll take you into my room. The numerous family and the wide connections of the youthful-looking private secretary cherished for him the hope of an austere and exalted dynasty. Meantime, the social sphere is adorned in his hours of idleness, chose to pet him under the above nickname, and Sir Ethelred, hearing it upon the lips of his wife and girls every day, mostly at breakfast time, had conferred upon it the dignity of unsmiling adoption. The assistant commissioner was surprised and gratified extremely. I shall certainly bring my discoveries to the house on the chance of you having the time, too. I won't have the time, interrupted the great personage, but I will see you. I haven't the time now, and you are going yourself. Yes, Sir Ethelred, I think it the best way. The personage had tilted his head back so far that, in order to keep the assistant commissioner under his observation, he had to nearly close his eyes. Hmm, ha, and how do you propose? Will you assume a disguise? Hardly a disguise. I'll change my clothes, of course. Of course, repeated the great man with a sort of absent-minded loftiness. He turned his big head slowly, and over his shoulder gave a haughty, oblique stare to the ponderous marble timepiece with the sly, feeble tick 
the gilt hands had taken the opportunity to steal through no less than five and twenty minutes behind his back. The assistant commissioner, who could not see them, grew a little nervous in the interval, but the great man presented to him a calm and undismayed face. Very well, he said, and paused, as if in deliberate contempt of the official clock. But what first put you in motion in this direction? I have been always of opinion, began the assistant commissioner. Ah, yes, opinion, that's of course, but the immediate motive. What shall I say, Sir Ethelred? A new man's antagonism to old methods, a desire to know something at first hand, some impatience. It's my old work, but the harness is different. It has been chafing me a little in one or two tender places. I hope you'll get on over there, said the great man kindly, extending his hand, soft to the touch, but broad and powerful, like the hand of a glorified farmer. The assistant commissioner shook it and withdrew. In the outer room, Tootles, who had been waiting perched on the edge of a table, advanced to meet him, subduing his natural buoyancy. Well, satisfactory, he asked with airy importance. Perfectly. You've earned my undying gratitude, answered the assistant commissioner, whose long face looked wooden in contrast with the peculiar character of the other's gravity, which seemed perpetually ready to break into ripples and chuckles. That's all right, but seriously, you can't imagine how irritated he is by the attacks on his bill for the nationalization of fisheries. They call it the beginning of social revolution. Of course, it is a revolutionary measure, but these fellows have no decency. The personal attacks. Odious, eh? And you have no notion of what a mass of work he has got to get through every day. He does it all himself, seems unable to trust anyone with these fisheries and yet he's given a whole half hour to the consideration of my very small sprat interjected the assistant commissioner small is it i'm glad to hear that but it's a pity you didn't keep it away then this fight takes it out of him frightfully the man's getting exhausted i feel it by the way he leans on my arm as we walk over and i say is he safe in the streets Mullins has been marching his men up here this afternoon. There is a constable stuck by every lamp post, and every second person we meet between this and Palace Yard is an obvious tech. It will get on his nerves presently. I see these foreign scoundrels aren't likely to throw something at him, are they? It would be a national calamity. The country can't spare him. Not to mention yourself, he leans on your arm, suggested the assistant commissioner soberly. You would both go. It would be an easy way for a young man to go down into history. Not so many British ministers have been assassinated as to make it a minor incident. But seriously now, I am afraid that if you want to go down into history, you'll have to do something for it. Seriously, there is no danger, whatever, for both of you, but from overwork. The sympathetic Tootles welcomed this opening for a chuckle. The fisheries won't kill me. I am used to late hours, he declared with ingenious levity. But feeling an instant compunction, he began to assume an air of statesmanlike moodiness as one draws on a glove. His massive intellect will stand any amount of work. It's his nerves that I am afraid of. The reactionary gang, with that abusive brute cheeseman at their head, insult him every night. If he will insist on beginning a revolution, murmured the assistant commissioner, the time has come, and he is the only man great enough for the work, protested the revolutionary toodles, flaring up under the calm, speculative gaze of the assistant commissioner. Somewhere in a corridor, a distant bell tinkled urgently, 
and with devoted vigilance the young man pricked up his ears at the sound. He's ready to go now, he exclaimed in a whisper, snatched up his hat, and vanished from the room. The assistant commissioner went out by another door in a less elastic manner. Again he crossed the wide thoroughfare, walked along a narrow street, and re-entered hastily his own departmental buildings. He kept up this accelerated pace to the door of his private room. Before he had closed it fairly, his eyes sought his desk. He stood still for a moment, then walked up, looked all round the floor, sat down on his chair, rang a bell, and waited. Chief Inspector Heat, gone yet? Yes, sir. Went away half an hour ago. He nodded. That will do. And sitting still, with his hat pushed off his forehead, he thought that it was just like Heat's confounded cheek to carry off quietly the only piece of material evidence. But he thought this without animosity. Old and valued servants will take liberties. The piece of overcoat with the address sewn on was certainly not a thing to leave about. Dismissing from his mind this manifestation of Chief Inspector Heat's mistrust, he wrote and dispatched a note to his wife, charging her to make his apologies to Michaelis's great lady, with whom they were engaged to dine that evening. The short jacket and the low, round hat he assumed in a sort of curtained alcove containing a washstand, a row of wooden pegs and a shelf brought out wonderfully the length of his grave brown face. He stepped back into the full light of the room, looking like the vision of a cool, reflective Don Quixote, with sunken eyes of a dark, enthusiastic, and a very deliberate manner. He left the scene of his daily labors quickly, like an unobtrusive shadow, his descent into the street was like the descent into a slimy aquarium from which the water had been run off. A murky, gloomy dampness enveloped him. The walls of the houses were wet. The mud of the roadway glistened with an effect of phosphorescence, and when he emerged into the strand, out of a narrow street by the side of Charing Cross Station, the genius of the locality assimilated him. He might have been but one more of the queer foreign fish that can be seen of an evening about there, fitting round the dark corners. He came to a stand on the very edge of the pavement and waited. His exercised eyes had made out in the confused movements of lights and shadows thronging the roadway the crawling approach of a hansom. He gave no sign, but when the low step gliding along the curbstone came to his feet, he dodged in skillfully in front of the big turning wheel and spoke up through the little trap door almost before the man gazing supinely ahead from his perch was aware of having been boarded by a fare. It was not a long drive. It ended by signal abruptly. Nowhere in particular, between two lamp posts, before a large drapery establishment, a long range of shops already lapped up in sheets of corrugated iron for the night. Tendering a coin through the trap door, the fare slipped out and away, leaving an effect of uncanny, eccentric, ghastliness upon the driver's mind, but the size of the coin was satisfactory to his touch, and his education not being literary, he remained untroubled by the fear of finding it presently turned to a dead leaf in his pocket. Raised above the world of fares by the nature of his calling, he contemplated their actions with a limited interest. The sharp pulling of his horse right round expressed his philosophy. 
Meantime, the assistant commissioner was already giving his order to a waiter in a little Italian restaurant round the corner, one of those traps for the hungry, long and narrow, baited with a perspective of mirrors and white napery, without air, but with an atmosphere of their own, an atmosphere of fraudulent cookery, mocking and abject mankind, and the most pressing of its miserable necessities. In this immoral atmosphere, the assistant commissioner, reflecting upon his enterprise, seemed to lose some more of his identity. He had a sense of loneliness, of evil freedom. It was rather pleasant. When, after paying for his short meal, he stood up and waited for his change, he saw himself in the sheet of glass and was struck by his foreign appearance. He contemplated his own image with a melancholy and inquisitive gaze, then, by sudden inspiration, raised the collar of his jacket. This arrangement appeared to him commendable, and he completed it by giving an upward twist to the ends of his black mustache. He was satisfied by the subtle modification of his personal aspect caused by these small changes. That'll do very well, he thought. I'll get a little wet, a little splashed. He became aware of the waiter at his elbow and of a small pile of silver coins on the edge of the table before him. The waiter kept one eye on it, while his other eye followed the long back of a tall, not very young girl, who passed up to a distant table, looking perfectly sightless and altogether unapproachable. She seemed to be a habitual customer. Going out, the assistant commissioner made to himself the observation that the patrons of the place had lost in the frequentation of fraudulent cookery all their natural and private characteristics. And this was strange, since the Italian restaurant is such a peculiarly British institution. But these people were as denationalized as the dishes set before them, with every circumstance of unstamped respectability. Neither was their personality stamped in any way, professionally, socially, or racially. They seemed created for the Italian restaurant, unless the Italian restaurant had been perchance created for them. But that last hypothesis was unthinkable, since one could not place them anywhere outside those special establishments. One never met these enigmatic persons elsewhere. It was impossible to form a precise idea what occupations they followed by day and where they went to bed at night, and he himself had become unplaced it would have been impossible for anybody to guess his occupation. As to going to bed, there was a doubt even in his own mind, not indeed in regard to his domicile itself, but very much so in respect of the time when he would be able to return there. A pleasurable feeling of independence possessed him when he heard the glass doors swing to behind his back, with a sort of imperfect, baffled thud. He advanced at once into an immensity of great slime and damp plaster, interspersed with lamps, and enveloped, oppressed, penetrated, choked, and suffocated by the blackness of a wet London night, which is composed of soot and drops of water. Brett Street was not very far away, it branched off, narrow, from the side of an open, triangular space, surrounded by dark and mysterious houses, temples of petty commerce, emptied of traders for the night. Only a fruiter's stall at the corner made a violent blaze of light and color. Beyond all was black, and the few people passing in that direction vanished at one stride beyond the glowing heaps of oranges and lemons. No footsteps echoed. 
they would never be heard of again. The adventurous head of the Special Crimes Department watched these disappearances from a distance with an interested eye. He felt light-hearted, as though he had been ambushed all alone in a jungle many thousands of miles away from departmental desks and official inkstands. This joyousness and dispersion of thought before a task of some importance seems to prove that this world of ours is not a very serious affair after all, for the assistant commissioner was not constitutionally inclined to levity. The policeman on the beat projected his somber and moving form against the luminous glory of oranges and lemons, and entered Brett Street without haste. The assistant commissioner, as though he were a member of the criminal classes, lingered out of sight, awaiting his return. But this constable seemed to be lost forever to the force. He never returned, must have gone out at the other end of Brett Street. The assistant commissioner, reaching this conclusion, entered the street in his turn, and came upon a large van, arrested in front of the dimly lit window panes of a carter's eating house. The man was refreshing himself inside, and the horses, their big heads lowered to the ground, fed out of nose bags steadily. Farther on, on the opposite side of the street, another suspect patch of dim light issued from Mr. Verloc's shop front, hung with papers, heaving with vague piles of cardboard boxes and the shapes of books. The assistant commissioner stood observing it across the roadway. There could be no mistake. By the side of the front window, encumbered by the shadows of nondescript things, the door, standing ajar, let escape on the pavement a narrow, clear streak of gas light within. Behind the assistant commissioner, the van and horses merged into one mass, seemed something alive, a square-backed black monster blocking half the street with sudden iron-shod stampings, fierce jingles, and heavy blowing sighs, the harshly festive, ill-omened glare of a large and prosperous public house faced the other end of Brett Street, across a wide road. This barrier of blazing lights, opposing the shadows, gathered about the humble abode of Mr. Verloc's domestic happiness, seemed to drive the obscurity of the street back upon itself, make it more sullen, brooding, and sinister.